Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. Today we'll finally be moving on from bubble sort deviations and be talking about one of the most popular sorting algorithms out there, merge sort. We can define merge sort as a stable, comparison-based, recursive, divide-and-conquer algorithm which repeatedly breaks down a list of elements into smaller and smaller parts, then slowly puts it back together. This is going to be our first large jump in complexity when it comes to sorting algorithms. With selection sort or bubble sort, the algorithms could get complicated at times, yes, but nothing to the extent of a sorting algorithm like merge sort. The greater the complexity, of course, comes with the bonus that merge sort is going to be a lot more efficient than those algorithms, but we'll get to that later. Because merge sort is much more complicated than anything we've covered so far, Let's break down the definition a little bit further, since by my count we used four different adjectives to describe the algorithm, each of them adding to the overall complexity of the definition. Starting with stable, this is something we've covered before in our selection sort video, but the gist of it is that a stable sorting algorithm will preserve the order of duplicates when sorting, while an unstable algorithm will not. For basic examples, this isn't too important, but as the complexity of the programs that you write increases, knowing which algorithms are stable and which are not can play a big part in which one you choose to implement on a database or program. For example, if you have a banking database wherein two users share the same name, and then you sort the database by name so that you can perform a binary search on it, it's going to be extremely important that the people with the same names have their positions preserved. If not, this could end up compromising the entirety of the database, with people switching account details without you even noticing. If you want an in-depth explanation of stability in sorting algorithms, check out that portion of our selection sort video, which is linked in the top right corner as well as in the description below. Otherwise, let's move on. Stating that the algorithm is comparison-based is nothing new to us. It simply means that in order to get the list from an unsorted state to a sorted state, we do so by comparing elements. To get the list in ascending order, like we want, we'll compare elements and place them in their correct spot, lower numbers to the left and higher numbers to the right. Now when we state that the algorithm is recursive, we mean that the algorithm has a function call to itself inside of itself. Basically, inside the actual merge sort algorithm, we will be calling the merge sort algorithm again. You'll see this later on, but essentially we call merge sort on smaller and smaller portions of the list to help us sort. For example, in a list of four elements, we might call merge sort on the list, and inside that merge sort call, we might then call merge sort on both the left and right side of that list. And through those merge sort calls, we might call merge sort on the left and right sides of those sublists. We understand that this can be confusing, and having a good understanding of recursion as a whole makes this a little bit easier to comprehend. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description and a card in the top right corner, which will both lead you to that portion of our Introduction to Programming series where we talk about recursion. Finally, divide and conquer. The idea of a divide and conquer algorithm is based on the fact that smaller portions of a problem are easier to comprehend than the entire problem at once. Divide and conquer algorithms are split into three steps. Divide, conquer, and combine. During the divide stage, we divide the problem into smaller and smaller subproblems. This is where recursion comes into play. We'll be using recursion to get the list into the smallest sublists possible. Then, during the conquer stage, once we have the problem broken down into manageable subproblems, we can solve each of the subproblems on their own. Finally, in the combine stage, we combine all of the now solved subproblems into one large solution and return it back to the user. So, in terms of a sorting algorithm, a divide and conquer methodology would split the list into smaller and smaller sublists using recursion, sort those sublists, and then finally combine the sorted sublists together into a single sorted list. 
You may not know it yet, but what we've just described there are the basics of a merge sort. Of course, the actual algorithm is a little bit more complicated than that, but it gives you a good starting point for our discussion. So there it is. Stable, comparison-based, recursive, divide and conquer. Four adjectives that hopefully help you understand the gist of merge sort. Now that we have the basics down, let's finally just jump straight into it and talk about what the pseudocode for merge sort looks like. For this portion of the video, I'm going to refer to the division of the list, or the divide part of our divide and conquer algorithm, as the breakdown phase. And the recombining of our list, or the conquer and combine part of our divide and conquer algorithm, as the build up phase. The first thing to point out with merge sort is that when using this algorithm, we will actually have three arguments passed into the function. These are going to be an integer representing the leftmost index of the array that we want to sort, an integer representing the rightmost index of the array that we want to sort, and an array, which of course is the actual list that we're sorting itself. The first time we call merge sort on a list, these will be hard coded by the user typically passing in 0 as the leftmost index, the size of the list minus 1 as the rightmost index, and of course the full array of the list we want to sort as the array. This is important to mention because, again, we are going to use recursion within our code, and for each of these recursive calls, we'll have to have the computer calculate these points, instead of having them hard-coded. Okay, so we start with the leftmost and rightmost points of the array that we're sorting which I'll call left and right, as well as the array, which I'll abbreviate to ARR, or R. The first thing we do in the actual code is check if the rightmost index of our array is greater than the leftmost index of our array. This is what's going to eventually break us out of our recursive loop. If you're familiar with recursion, this is what's known as a base case. Once this statement becomes false, we can know that we're done with the recursive breakdown phase of our sort and can move on to the build up phase. Looking at this statement, you can see that this will only become true once the left and right indexes are the same. In other words, we're done breaking down the list into smaller and smaller sublists once each sublist is only one element in size. Now, if the leftmost index is not less than the rightmost index, we know that we are still in the breakdown phase of our sort. So what we do is go into a loop and execute steps A through D, which essentially helps break the list down even further, taking it closer and closer to our base case, in which the list is in its smallest possible state. Step A is to define an integer middle, which is the middle point of our array or subarray. We calculate this by adding the leftmost and rightmost index, which we have because they are passed into the function, and dividing by 2. Now if the list is odd in length, don't worry, that's okay. The computer will simply truncate that index down to the lowest integer value. So if the leftmost index was 0 and the rightmost was 9, the middlemost index would be calculated as 4.5, which ends up being truncated to 4 and so 4 is treated as the middlemost value of our subarray, even though technically it's 4.5. Step B is to perform a merge sort on the left side of the array, and step C is to perform a merge sort on the right side of the array. This is where recursion comes into play. We are calling the merge sort algorithm that we're currently in on the left and right sides of the array or subarray. Also, if you remember, we need to pass in three values into our merge sort, the left and rightmost indexes of the array we want to sort, and the full array that we're sorting. We find these using the left and rightmost indexes that were passed into this initial merge sort function, as well as the middle index that we just calculated. So for step B, we call merge sort passing the leftmost index as the leftmost index, and the middle index as the rightmost index and the array that was passed into this merge sort call as the array. For step C, we call merge sort passing the middle index plus 1 as the leftmost index, and the rightmost index as the rightmost index, and then of course the array. What this essentially does is split the list into two equal parts. 
In each of these merge sort calls, the two halves of the list will get split down even further and further until they are all one element large. That is the power of recursion and the backbone of how merge sort works. These first three steps make up the breakdown phase of our algorithm. We use them to get the list into small enough sublists so that we can easily use comparison based logic to build them back up. Speaking of building up, this is where step D finally comes into play. Step D instructs us to merge the two halves of the list that we sorted in steps B and C. This is actually a separate function outside of the merge sort function, which serves to merge two sorted subarrays into a sorted main array. How do we do this? Well, let's dive into it. I'm going to bring up a new slide just to cover the merging function. The first thing to know about the merge function is that it takes in both the left index, middle index, right index, and array as arguments. These will be used to help merge the two sorted parts of the list. The first actual statement that we conduct is to create two temporary arrays in memory, one to store the left elements of the subarray and one to store the right elements of the subarray. Now notice how I said temporary arrays. Merge sort actually uses auxiliary memory to sort the list, making it the first of our algorithms to do so. Anyways, we copy the information from the left side of the array, meaning all the elements from the leftmost index to the middlemost index, into a temporary array that I'll call L. Remember, these values were determined in the merge sort pseudocode and then passed into this function. Following that, we then copy the information from the right side of the array, meaning all the elements from the middle index plus one to the rightmost index, and now what we have are two subarrays which represent the information contained in the main list. Now something extremely important to note here is that when I say main list, I simply mean the main list that was determined from the left and rightmost indexes that were passed into the particular merge sort call. We could have four elements composing the main list, two for the left side and two for the right side, and also have another main list, which is four more elements which aren't contained within the scope of this merge. Eventually, we're going to have to merge with that list in order to get a complete sorted list, but for now we're just worried about merging these two sublists into the main list of four elements. Okay, cool. Now the next step is to slowly repopulate the main list with the elements of the sublists in order. We do this by looping across the three lists that we have, the temporary left list, the temporary right list, and the main list. We loop until we reach the end of one of our sublists. What we do is compare the indexes of the sublists. If the element in the left list is smaller, we set the index of the main list to be this element, and then increase the left list index and the main list index. Else, the element in the right list is smaller, and so we set the index of the main list to be this element, and then increase the right list index and the main list index. The final step, once we have reached the end of one of our sublists, is to copy any remaining elements of either the left or right array back into the main list and then delete the two temporary arrays. This is complicated. The merging sequence for merge sort is probably the most complicated part of it, besides the recursion. So let me do a quick example to show you how things work. Let's say we have a main array of four elements, and we are merging a left side array of two elements and a right side array of two elements. We first copy the left elements into a temporary L array and the right elements into a temporary R array. Then we begin looping. To make things clear for you guys, we'll mark the current index that we're on for all three lists in a different color. L will be light green and is initially set to the first element of the left array. R is light blue and is initially set to the first element of the right array and the main array is a light purple and is initially set to the first element of the main array. So we compare the values at the index of the left array 
with the index of the right array. Since 4 is less than 6, we set the first index of the main array to the first index of the left array. So 4 is written there. Now 4 is already the first index of the main array, so nothing needs to be overwritten, but that's besides the point. We increase the index of the left array and the main array, but not the right array. This time, we end up comparing the values at the second index of the left array with the first index of the right array. But now, since 6 is less than 7, what we do is set the second index of the main array to the first index of the right array meaning that we set 6 as the second index of the main array and overwrite 7. We now increase the right index and the main index, but not the left index. Hopefully you guys can see where this is going. Since we still haven't gone outside the index range of either of our temporary arrays, we keep going. We now compare the value at the second index of the left array with the value at the second index of the right array. And since 7 is less than 9, we copy 7 in as the third element of the main array and increase the left index and the main index once again. Now we've hit a breaking point. Since we have passed the end of the left array, we copy the remaining elements from the right array, meaning that 9 gets copied in as the last element of the main array. Again, we increase the index of the main array and the right array. We have now gone out of the range of both of our sublists, and so that's the show. We have successfully just merged these two subarrays back into a single main array. Give yourself a pat on the back. That is the merge function. Hopefully you can see that it takes on a pretty simple pattern. We take a list, turn it into two sublists, and then simply add the smaller value from each sublist, increasing the index as we go. Once we run out of elements, we have a larger sorted main list. Basically, we'll repeat this process for each main list, increasing the size of the list that we're merging each time, and eventually we'll get to a point where we merge the two final sublists into one final main list, which will be the sorted array. Going back to the pseudocode page, we can now complete step D, which is to call this merge function on a subarray which starts at the leftmost index includes the middlemost index, and finishes off with the rightmost index, also passing in the full array as an argument so we can overwrite values. We now have the complete pseudocode for a merge sort. Obviously, this is way more complicated than, say, a bubble sort or a selection sort, so what we're now going to do is run a full merge sort on a list of eight elements. This should give you a better idea of how the algorithm actually runs. Now because of the complexity of merge sort, we're not going to do a complete step-by-step -step analysis of every single instruction for merge sort, like we've done for previous videos. Rather, we'll do an abbreviated version of it, taking you through the most important parts. I'll link a video in the description below which covers an example merge sort in its entirety if you're interested. Okay, so we have a list of eight elements, unsorted. Initially, the leftmost index is zero, the rightmost index is 7, and r is of course just the array. Since right is greater than left, we calculate the middle of the two values and find that the value is the third index. We then call merge sort on the two subarrays, so the one from the zeroth index to the third index, and the one from the fourth index to the seventh. Now in both of these cases, the left and right indexes, which are passed into the function, are not equal to each other meaning the right index is still greater than the left one. So we haven't reached our base case in either of these subcalls just yet. Once again, that means we enter our loop. For the left array, we calculate the middle as 1.5, which gets truncated to one. For the right array, we calculate the middle index as the sixth index by adding up four and nine and dividing by two, which yields 6.5 or six when you truncate it. Then we call merge sort on both the left and right side of the array. So in this case, we call merge sort on the 3 and 9 elements and on the 1 and 10 elements. Then, again, we call merge sort on the left and right halves of the list, so 4 and 13 get their own merge sort call, as well as 5 and 2. 
All right, now again, in none of our subarrays are the left and right indexes equal to each other. So we need to call merge sort on each of these elements. So three, nine, one, 10, four, 13, five, and two, all get their own merge sort calls. Now the cool thing about these merge sort calls is that the left and right indexes are equal to each other. You can tell because of the grayish color. Why gray? Well, if you mix green and blue, you get gray. I know this because I had to look it up for the sake of this video, which for a college student is extremely sad. Anyways, since the right index is now not greater than the left index, since it's equal to the left index, we've now reached our base case and can exit the loop and begin merging. We've got a lot of merging to do, so let's just start from left to right. Beginning with three and nine, they each are their own subarrays respectively, with three making up the entirety of the temporary left array and nine making up the entirety of the temporary right array. This makes things simple enough in that we copy the lower element, in this case three, and then copy the remaining element, in this case nine. Now in the main array for this subcall, three and nine were already in that order, so we don't actually overwrite any values just yet. After this, of course, we can delete the L and R array since we are no longer using them. Moving on to one and 10, again, one becomes the temporary left array and 10 becomes the temporary right array. We copy one in as the lower element and add 10 to the back end. Again, no overwriting needed, and we can delete the temporary arrays. Repeating this process again with four and 13, four gets added as the lower element, 13 gets added as the back element. Again, no elements overwritten, and we can delete the temp arrays. Finally, we repeat the process one more time with five and two. This time, two is less than five, and so we overwrite the first element in the main array with two, and then add five to the back end, deleting the temporary arrays afterwards. We have now successfully merged the bottom branch of our merge sort tree. Now I want you to notice something. Each of these main arrays are now in sorted order. Three is less than nine, one is less than 10, four is less than 13, and two is less than five. This is a pattern that will stay the same throughout the entirety of the buildup process and is literally the result of the sorting process. So take note of how the elements shift over time. Right, now that we have these main arrays, if you will, these each get turned back into subarrays as we merge the next level of our merge sort tree. And so the three and nine array would become a temporary left array L and the one and 10 subarray would become a temporary right array R. And the same goes for the two subarrays on either side. And now we just merge again. So on the left two arrays, we start by setting up our indexes. We compare the first two elements, and since one is the smaller element amongst the two subarrays, we overwrite the first element in the main array and increase the main index and the right index. Next, we compare three and 10. And three is less than 10, so three gets written in next main index gets increased, and so does the left index. After that, we compare the last elements in each subarray and copy nine into the main array since it's the lower of the two. We increase the indexes of the main array and left arrays again, and since we have exited out of the range of values for the left array, we finish off by copying what's left of the right array into the main array. So 10 gets written in as 10. Now this left side of the list is sorted and we can delete the two temporaries and move on to the right side. Let's pick up the pace, shall we? We set up our indexes and start by comparing four and two. Two is less than four, so we will replace the number at the first index of the main array with two. We then increase the indexes on the main and right arrays. Then we compare four and five. Since four is less than five, that's the number we replace as the second element of the main array. Increasing the indexes of the main and left arrays this time, that causes us to compare five and 13. Five is of course less than 13, so we copy that in as the third element. 
Finally, we increase the indexes of the main and right array once again, and since we have reached the end point of our right array, we copy the remaining elements of the left array into the main array, and bam, we have concluded our merge of the right and left subarrays. We can delete our two temporary arrays and of course move on. Now our final step here is to merge the final two subarrays back into our initial array. After this process is complete, we will have finished sorting our list in its entirety. Let's begin as we always do by setting up our three indexes. We can speed through this process now since we're such experts. With one and two, one is the lower number, so that's the number that gets written into our first index. We increase the indexes, now comparing 3 and 2. This time, 2 is the lower number, so we write that into our main array. Increasing again, we now compare 3 and 4, with 3 being the smaller of the two. We write that into the array and increase our indexes again. Now we compare 9 and 4, with the latter being the smaller of the two, and so we write that into its correct place. Increasing our indexes leads us to compare 9 and 5. The element in the right array, 5, is still the lower of the two, and so we write that into the main array. We increase our indexes and compare 9 with 13. Finally, 9 is the lower of the two, and so we add 9 into the main array. Increasing the indexes again, and 10 gets compared to 13. 10 is less than 13, and so we add it to the main array and increase our indexes. We have finally reached out of bounds of one of our subarrays, the left one, and so we copy the rest of the right array, which is just the integer 13, back into our main array. We can now delete our two subarrays, and there we have it. With that, we have sorted a list of eight elements using merge sort. Again, this is very complicated, I know. So let's take it one step further and see how it looks on a large scale using the visualizer. As we begin sorting, notice how we are basically overwriting the data that is stored at each point once we reach that position in the merge sort. It almost looks as if the sorting algorithm is taking place in place, but don't let the visualization fool you. What isn't being shown are the temporary arrays that are being created and deleted to help sort each sublist. Another thing to notice is that each sublist is a sorted portion of the list in its own. Even if the sublist consists of two elements, those two elements are sorted. When that sublist of two elements gets combined with another sublist of two elements, that four element combined list will also be a sorted portion of the list. We continue to do this until the entire list is sorted. It's as simple, or I guess as complicated, as that. Okay, so hopefully we have a pretty good understanding of how the algorithm works. Or at least I would hope so after 25 minutes of lecturing. So now it's time to talk about its time complexity. Now if the length of this video hasn't convinced you yet, merge sort is complicated. However, with this complexity comes a huge buff in efficiency. If you remember back to the previous episodes for our time complexity equations, best case was usually O of 1, average case was usually O of n squared, and worst case was usually also O of n squared. Well, with merge sort, all three of its time complexity equations are O of n log n. Now if you're not familiar with logarithmic functions, you should A, check out our video on time complexity, obviously, and B, just know that this is far more efficient than O of n squared, especially once you start increasing the list to massive lengths. The reason why these equations are what they are has to do with the fact that the recursive subcalls of merge sort take varying time complexities to complete depending on which level of the merge you are on. A merge at the base case isn't going to take too long, since you're only merging two elements. But the final merge is going to take a while. This averages out to a time complexity of O n log n for all three time complexities. Which, if you think about it, makes sense. Even if we're given the list in sorted order, we're still going to recursively break the list down into some number of subarrays, and we're still going to merge those subarrays back into one large one. 
it doesn't matter that the list is already sorted. With the other algorithms we've talked about, we could be done with things after a single pass, but with merge sort, that's just not the case. Of course, it makes up for this by having one of the best average and worst case scenario time complexities that algorithms can have, so it's all about weighing the strengths and weaknesses of these different algorithms. Speaking of strengths and weaknesses, merge sort also has a space complexity of O of n. This has to do with the temporary arrays that we create during the merging process. Luckily, these temporary arrays are, well, temporary, and get deleted in memory after we use them. So we will only ever have a maximum space complexity of O of n, representing the temporary arrays that are created for the last merge that takes place, or the one which correctly places the list in sorted order. Again, this is not ideal for programs which need to work on limited space, and so you as the programmer is going to have to weigh the options and decide if the increased speed and efficiency outweighs the auxiliary space required to implement a merge sort. Now one thing I will say is that there are ways to make merge sort have an O of 1 time complexity through variations in the code, but since we're just covering the basic merge sort today, that's what we're going to stick with for its time complexity. And with that, we come to our final segment, common uses of merge sort. Now because merge sort actually is an efficient sorting algorithm, it does get used a lot in real world applications. Implementations such as sorting files on your hard drive or sifting through years and years of stock market data in a particular way or sorting a database of names online all of these could use a merge sorting algorithm. The truth is, the biggest boon of merge sort is actually its stability. Since merge sort is a stable algorithm, it gets implemented a lot in a lot of database scenarios. It's also really good for distributed scenarios in which additional data arrives during or after sorting. Overall, merge sort is a very solid algorithm. While its complexity may drive some programmers away, its efficiency cannot be overlooked. And plus, you just finished listening to an 18-year-old lecture about it for 32 minutes, so you basically have all the skills you need to implement it correctly. Additionally, merge sorts include many different concepts, such as recursion, the divide and conquer approach, the use of other algorithms within the algorithm, etc., etc. This makes merge sort a hot topic for interview questions. Learning the algorithm and mastering it will give you a huge advantage in any computer science scenario. And that concludes our discussion on merge sort. Again, as a recap, it's a stable, comparison-based, recursive, divide-and-conquer algorithm which repeatedly breaks down a list of elements into smaller and smaller parts, then slowly builds it back together in a sorted manner. Now this was a lengthy episode with a lot of information, and it took quite a while to put together. So if at any point you learned something new or you just overall enjoyed the video in any way, consider dropping a like and subscribing as we have more videos like these on the way. Also, feel free to comment any and all questions you may have below, and I'll be sure to answer them. With that being said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.